All right, uh, happy to be here and to present some of the work we've done uh, with long read sequencing. And in the context of hoping to accelerate and facilitate diagnosis of acute leukemia. And the title, uh, title of the talk is Rapid Epigenomic Classification of Acute Leukemia with Long Read Sequencing. So le leukemia diagnosis is an area that's very near and dear to my heart. I'm a, in my clinical role, I'm a hematopathologist. So our main you know, objective is to take samples from patients who are suspected of, of having acute leukemia and render a diagnosis that is fast but also accurate and precise, or as, as precise as possible. And if anyone's ever looked at the WHO criteria for acute leukemia, uh, it's quite long. There are many, many different subtypes of acute leukemia. And that really reflects all of the work, you know, work that's been done in leukemia diagnostics over, over decades. Listed here are just some of the main data points that we try to collect. There's morphologic analysis, which gets done pretty quickly flow cytometry, immunohistochemistry for protein biomarkers, targeted gene sequencing, and cytogenetics. And we attempt to integrate all of these data types to come to uh, a leukemia classification. Now, as you can also see, this takes time, uh, upwards of two weeks in many cases. And delays here can really prevent our clinical colleagues from you know, having important conversations with family planning out treatment strategies and, you know, really moving a patient along for, for optimal care. So we think there's a lot of room for improvement in this area. And our hypothesis going into this, this project was that epigenomic classification, including with long read sequencing of leukemia, will really improve this whole, this whole procedure. It'll be faster, more precise, and complementary to standard of care methods. Okay, so why, why would we hypothesize that? Why epigenomics for rapid leukemia classification? Well, the, the first point is that DNA methylation really has a key role in gene regulation and tumorigenesis generally. Uh, one area is in, in promoter methylation, where it's known to be involved in gene silencing. Uh, a cla you know, classic examples of this are tumor suppressor inactivation, things like CDK and 2A. And then also in leukemia in particular, there's recurrent alterations in DNA methylation pathways in genes such as DNMT3A or TET2. So we think there's a lot of reason to, to you know, capture methylation data for, for leukemia. The other uh, encouraging sign in, in this direction is that cancers are known to show distinct epigenetic states or epitypes that both recapitulate standard of, you know, standard categories, but also can refine standard categories. This has been, been shown both for CNS tumors on the left, where methylation-based clustering beautifully resolves all the major molecular subtypes of, of CNS tumors, really allows us to go beyond histology in many cases. And then also in some uh, you know, focus studies in acute leukemia, this beautiful one uh, uh, from, from genome research in 2021 looking at AML, where you can find very distinct epigenetic states in AML that correlate roughly with uh, standard genetic molecular categories. And then the last piece, which re was really the most critical for this, is that there's been you know, transformative new sequencing technologies for DNA methylation profiling in the clinic, and Oxford Nanopore uh, is, is really, I think, the leader here. Uh, the main, I think, point from a diagnostic standpoint is this technology allows for very, very simplified workflows and simplified sequencing such that you can actually be generating sequencing data in a matter of maybe an hour from the time that you get a sample, sample, if not even faster than that. And this has been used already in, you know, intraoperatively in the setting of CNS tumors. And here's a beautiful study from 2023 that showed this, including the whole detailed timeline going from sample collection to DNA isolation, library prep, and sequencing all in a matter of an hour, uh, hour or more ultimately leading to a precise methylation-based classification for, for C, uh, you know, CNS tumors, in this case, a schwannoma. And then as a bonus, you, of course, get all the conventional genetic DNA sequencing with these runs. And this allows you to look at things like copy number alterations, uh, SNPs and indels, and, and gene rearrangements, all of which are really critical for leukemia classification as well. Okay, so the collaboration we had uh, on this project is shown here. Uh, folks from my lab, the Griffin Lab, including uh, Reyes Capella and Andre Montalioni, 
a wonderful computational collaboration with the Hofstadt Lab at uh, Dana-Farber, including uh, Till Steinecke and uh, Salvatore Benfato, who are the, the you know, trainees leading this. And then also a great clinical collaborator, Evan Chen at the Dana-Farber, who actually sees patients with, with leukemia. Okay, so an overview of our study. The first part was that we built a DNA methylation-based reference of acute leukemia. This is across all le acute leukemia lineages, so AML, TALL, and BALL. We did this through essentially collecting all of the published DNA methylation data uh, that, that is out there. This is for over 2,000 patients. And then using that data, we trained a, a neural network to classify Acute leukemia, uh, acute leukemia subtypes solely on the basis of their methylation profiles. And then we applied this model in a real-time prospective manner to rapidly classify new patients with acute leukemia. And we'll, I'll go through this step by step. Okay, so first, curation of this pan-leukemia DNA methyl methylation reference, aggregating data from multiple studies you can see in the bottom right, clustering, and suffice it to say that methylation-based classification or clustering of, of acute leukemia very nicely separates out different acute leukemia lineages. So you can see in the upper right is AML, in the bottom is BALL or B-cell uh, leukemia, and then the upper left is TALL. And then beyond this, it also resolves different molecular, molecular categories of, of each of these leukemias. Looking more closely at AML, you can see that uh, in many cases, these methylation-based classes correlate almost one-to-one -one with established genetic categories, things like core binding factor leukemia is shown in the bottom, bottom right, uh, CEBPA mutant leukemia is in the upper left, and it also correlates nicely with different FAB categories. Uh, one nice example here is M3 AML. This is acute promyelocytic leukemia that's characterized by this T1517 fusion between uh, PML and RARA. So it, it works very nice to, to recapitulate existing genetic categories. In addition, though, it goes beyond this, and it gives us additional, or it resolves additional heterogeneity that's not discoverable by genetics alone. And this is most apparent in the, in the case of OX-activated leukemias. These are leukemias that are often defined by mutations in NPM1 or uh, rearrangements in KMT2A or MLL. And we find uh, close to nine methylation-based subgroups uh, in the Hox-activated category. And so we think that there's a lot of additional heterogeneity here that methylation-based uh, testing can capture. Okay, uh, moving on to the, the machine learning classifier that we trained on the basis of this methylation reference. I won't go into the details here, but uh, Salvatore Benfato from the Hofstadt Lab really uh, led this work. And suffice it to say that the model was trained on, you know, again, over 2,000 2, samples, and it was optimized specifically to be functional with sparse CPG input data. And th this is really a key point, I think, for thinking about developing these classifiers for Nanoport. So we basically train the model by masking most of, most of the data in each round, and then this allowed the model to, to really learn how to deal with just very, very sparse input. And I'll just share this. This model uh, is now available online, and folks are welcome to access this, the full code and, and model itself. OK, so with this model in hand, we then validated it in a retrospective cohort at our institution at the Dana-Farber. Uh, shown here is the results of, of that validation for 19 patients. This were a variety of patients uh, presenting with acute leukemia, including AML, BALL, and I think one TALL. And, uh, you know, from a representation of, of molecular subtypes. And essentially, uh, the methylation-based classification with this Marlin machine learning classifier and Nanopore accurately identified 18 of the 19 cases here. So it was accurate in, in the vast majority. And it recapitulated the diagnosis uh, in most categories. This is shown on the top. But in the middle, the middle cases, the middle tranche of cases there, it also not just recapitulated diagnosis, but added an additional refinement. So helped substratify particularly these Hox activated cases. In addition, uh, 
while you know, the classifications are based solely on DNA methylation data, we also captured genetic events, gene rearrangements that are key to these, these molecular classes and really help validate that the methylation-based classes are real or accurate. And just shown here are a couple of representative cases of a Rung Swan fusion, a PML Rara fusion, and then also a Dux4 fusion, which is typically cryptic because it's a highly, a highly repetitive region. Um, so we were able to cap capture this in a, in a case of BALL. Okay, now maybe the most exciting piece of this, I think, is using it for rapid and real-time diagnosis in a prospective manner, so to really accelerate, you know, the provision of pre precise molecular information to, to clinicians, and this was, uh, you know, a collaboration with our clinical colleague Evan Chen at the Dana-Farber. Here's an example patient. Uh, this was a 61-year-old uh, who presented with clinical suspicion for acute leukemia. They had a bone marrow biopsy. We got the sample in our lab, and then shown uh, on the left is the timeline that, that ensued from that. So it was essentially 20 minutes or so of DNA extraction and some quality control, another 20 to 30 minutes of library prep, followed by loading this, this sample on the sequencer. And then after just 40 to 50 minutes of sequencing on the nanopore and the application of this real-time methylation classifier, we were able to generate a confident diagnosis of this category TP53 aneuploid enriched AML. So essentially in under two hours uh, from the time of sample receipt. So this is really, really fast. And you can see in the plot on the right, kind of a, uh, you know, almost a timestamp of the confidence uh, for each of these methylation class classes, as well as the, the confidence on the y-axis. And you can see that, it, you know, just under 40 minutes of sequencing, we, we reach uh, our confidence threshold for this methylation class. Okay, so was this accurate? How did this correlate with standard of care pathology? That's shown here on the right. So the conventional data came back at various points. There was a bone marrow aspirate that resulted around the same time as this, this methylation class. That bone marrow aspirate suggested AML but didn't give any additional data beyond that. Flow cytometry resulted the next day, gave some immunophenotype, but again, no, no detailed molecular information. And then our targeted sequencing and, and cytogenetics came back, you know, multiple days afterwards, which ultimately corroborated this diagnosis of AML with mu mutated uh, P53. And you can see some example images uh, here that recapitulate that, um, including just a beautiful P53 immunostain that shows diffuse expression, which is, which is aberrant for P53 in this context. Also, you see a, a nice genome-wide copy number profile that is consistent with broad genome instability in the setting of P53 mutant AML. I'll just highlight one additional case here. Uh, this is a 62-year-old, also suspected uh, for AML. Similar story, bone marrow biopsy, uh, rapid isolation of DNA, library prep, sequencing, ultimately coming to a, a methylation-based classification of AML Hox group 2 uh, under, in, in, in under 100 minutes. You can see the timestamp again. This correlated very nicely with conventional diagnostics, which resulted, you know, in this, a similar time frame, multiple days after after sample receipt. So, all in all, I think this is we've done more patients since this time, and it really is, you know, I think has the potential to accelerate diagnosis and provide much more detailed molecular information to clinicians to guide care. Uh, so, really, really excited about developing this more in the future. Okay, with that, I'll just touch on some future directions and then hopefully leave some time for questions. So there's a lot that remains to be learned about this approach uh, as we apply it to more patients and in more contexts. So I think one key question is to determine the sensitivity, specificity, and limits of detection of, of the strategy. There's clearly an influence of tumor cellularity on the ability for us to generate accurate classification. So when the tumor burden, you know, the number of malignant cells in your sample drops below some threshold, uh, the sensitivity, sensitivity of the method drops as well. So that's something to work on. Uh, we'd also like to validate performance across a bunch of additional leukemia cases, particularly rare subtypes that we haven't been able to validate yet. And also, we're in, in the process of starting a, a prospective clinical feasibility study where we're hoping to blow this up to a bunch of additional patients, do 30, 40, 50 additional patients. And, and you know, I think there'll be a lot to learn in, in, in that context. Also, for biomarkers, uh, you know, thinking about ways that we can use DNA methylation and epigenetic states as predictive 
either for outcome or treatment response. Comparing how these perform versus standard genetic strategies, I think, is a really exciting direction. Hope to pursue some of that. And then also, you know, really move towards integrative detection of epigenetic and genetic features in leukemia. Even though methylation-based classification, I think, is very exciting and very powerful, there are certainly some key genetic features that it doesn't capture. Uh, just one example is FLT3 uh, ITD mutations. They're key targetable mutations that are not captured by methylation-based profiling. So ultimately, this, this should be, you know, a complementary or envisioned as a complementary strategy. All right, so with that, I'll, I'll finish. Thank you, thank you very much for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.